Well, those of you who have been here for a while know that traditionally I use the month of August for two things. One, for vacation. I've already done that. And two, to spend time just seeking the Lord as to things He might want to say to us as an assembly of God's people as we launch into the fall and resume our normal schedule of ministries. And during that period, I don't prepare new messages. Historically in August, I reach back into the archives and pull out teachings that I've done in years past. And so that's what I'm going to be doing this weekend. We're going to go back to a message I preached a number of years ago based on the book of Exodus, based on a troubling time, but a transforming time in the life of one of the great heroes of faith. Perhaps you've heard of him, a guy named Moses. Our text is Exodus chapter 3, and in just a moment, I'm going to read verses 2 through 5 from this third chapter of Exodus. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then God said, Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And that's the title we're going to use for this study, Holy Ground. What is holy ground? What does it mean to be on holy ground? A few years ago, a very popular worship chorus sung in evangelical churches went like this, we are standing on holy ground. And I found myself wondering many times, do people know what holy ground is, or do they just sing about it? We're going to attempt to explain it this weekend. Before we do that, let's ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are coming and asking that the Holy Spirit be our teacher today, because no one can teach us your truth like the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the very author of Scripture. All Scripture is Spirit-inspired, Spirit-breathed. We are privileged as your people to have the author of Scripture living within us, to open the Word to us, to help us to see what it really means and what its implications are for our life. So we pray that we would be sensitive to the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit this day. And Father, I pray that you would help me in dependence upon the Holy Spirit to preach and teach your word faithfully and accurately. I simply want to be a mouthpiece, a human mouthpiece for the working of the Holy Spirit. So open our understanding, increase our faith, move us down the road as we grow in grace and in our knowledge of you. And we pray all of those things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. And as we study God's Word together today, may the Lord be with you. If you retrace the steps that led you into a spiritual predicament, that brought you to a place of having a real spiritual problem, if you retrace the steps that led you there long enough, you will round a bend and you will come face to face with your refusal to surrender to God. At the foundation of every spiritual problem we face, there is always that refusal to trust God and surrender our will to Him. And this story from the life of Moses illustrates that. Because there was a day in the wilderness when Moses rounded the bend and came face to face with his real Problem. He hadn't recognized his real problem up until that point. But he came face to face with his real problem, and that was his refusal to surrender to God. Moses 
is often thought of as a great liberator. In fact, he's become something of the symbol of liberation. But what a lot of people fail to recognize is that before Moses could deliver others from captivity, he had to be delivered from his own captivity. Before he could deliver Israel from captivity, he had to be delivered from his captivity. He had to get on holy ground. Now, what is holy ground? Well, this story from the life of Moses teaches us, first of all, that holy ground is a place of confessed weakness. Confessed weakness. It's a place where we finally come to grips with the reality that apart from from the power of God, we can do nothing. You see, earlier in his life, Moses saw one of his countrymen being severely beaten by an Egyptian, and what did he do? Took matters into his own hands, without consulting God, without waiting upon God, and he murdered that Egyptian soldier. Now, how did that work out for him? Not very well. Because the man who was concerned about his people and what was happening to them had to then flee into the wilderness, flee for his life where he would spend not the next 40 days, not the next 40 weeks, not even the next 40 months, but where he would spend the next 40 years of his life spinning his wheels and doing nothing for his people while they suffered in slavery back in Egypt. He took matters into his own hands, and he made a mess. But God uses delays. The 40-year delay in Moses' life, God was going to use that because God uses delays to make us aware of our limitations. He uses delays to make us aware of our limitations. Forty years of spinning his wheels in the wilderness made Moses aware of his own inadequacy. And you've got to come to that point before you can fulfill what God has for you in ministry. Prior to this point, Moses was suffering from what some have called a thick pride and a thin soul. He overestimated his own ability. And that's why God told him to remove his sandals. Have you ever wondered what's that all about? Taking off your sandals. God had him do that because Moses, as he stood before the burning bush, was actually insulting God. How so? Up until that point in his life, he had acted self-sufficiently. He took matters into his own hands. He acted like somebody who was confident in his own abilities. And the removal of the sandals was God's way of saying, when a mere man is standing in the presence of a sovereign God, trusting himself rather than that God, that's an insult to God. And Moses, you need to get rid of that insulting attitude. So when God said, take your sandals off, in Hebrew culture, God was asking him to renounce his self-sufficiency. To say, in essence, Lord, as I stand before you, I now recognize I've been trying to do this in my own strength and I'm not capable and I need to get out of the business of relying upon myself. That's what removing the sandals was all about. God was saying you need to quit depending just on your own abilities. Now, while this was happening, what's happening to Moses' people back in Egypt? Well, they're suffering from slavery. And we can be tempted to think, wow, how cold and how different and how cruel is God that he would let the Israelis suffer another 40 years of slavery while Moses is finally starting to get a clue. But lest we think God cruel and indifferent, Subsequent history would remind us that apart from faith, all of us find something of a false 
security in the predictability of our own personal slavery. See, it doesn't matter what you're enslaved to. It doesn't matter what you're addicted to. If you aren't careful, you'll begin to find a certain measure of false security in the predictability of your addiction, in the predictability of your own personal slavery. And that became very apparent when God finally led the people of Israel out of Egypt because what did they do time after time after time after time? They said, Oh, that we would have never left where? Egypt. Every time they ran into a difficulty, they sang the same song. Oh, that we would have never left Egypt. At least we knew what to expect when we were in Egypt. Out here, we don't know what a day's got to bring. Back there, we always knew what the day would bring. Same old, same old, but, but it was predictable. We knew what to expect. We could handle that. Now out here, every day is filled with questions. See, sometimes we can be more in love with sameness than with our Savior. We can love predictability more than faithful following after God. Because have you noticed, God isn't always predictable. He doesn't always follow the script we think He ought to follow. He sometimes surprises us with the way He does business and with the business that He does. So God left Egypt or Israel back in Egypt for a while. You see, it's been said that it only took God 40 hours, and this is true, it only took God 40 hours to get Israel out of Egypt, but it would take him another 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. 40 years, an entire generation, to get that slave mentality out of his people. You see, God not only uses delays to make us aware of our limitations, but God uses delays to help us grow weary of our false securities. Sometimes God delays His intervention in your life, or at least the intervention you want, <laughs> because you're still resting in something other than Him and you haven't gotten sick of it enough to let go of it. I mean, you've got to get really sick of the same old, same old before you will open yourself up to the new things and the better things God has for you. Now, what happened next reveals something else about holy ground. Holy ground is a place of exposed sin. Exposed sin. Now, Moses knew that there was sin in Egypt that the strongest empire on the face of the earth treated people in inhumane and degrading fashion and used whole populations for their own advantage. It was easy to identify the sin in Egypt. But before he could be used by God, Moses had to identify the sin in Moses. Moses had to identify his own sin. So in the chapter after the one we're studying, God had him do something rather unusual. God had him insert his hand into his robe. And when he took out his hand, it was white with the disease of leprosy. Then God had him put his hand back in his robe a second time, and when he pulled it out, it was restored, and it was normal again. Now, what was that all about? Trust me, it wasn't just God showing off. God was trying to illustrate something. He was telling Moses, we may look clean outwardly, while inwardly sin is at work. Moses could identify the sin in others, but Moses needed to know there's something corrupt in me. And even though outwardly I look like I've got it all together, God, who has searched my heart, knows there's some junk in there, some junk I need to deal with. 
Now, why did God choose leprosy to communicate that to Moses? I think three reasons. We're not told, but let me speculate. First of all, leprosy brought total devastation. And I believe God was telling Moses, Moses, as long as you try to control things, as long as you try to bring results through your own craftiness and your own skill and your own strength, as long as you just keep relying on yourself and overestimating your abilities, you're just going to make a mess. You've got to bring devastation. Secondly, there was no cure for leprosy. If you contracted leprosy, Nobody could do anything for you except God. And so I believe God was telling Moses, Moses, you're facing a problem. It's in your heart. And you can't fix this one, big guy. If I don't fix that problem for you, nobody will fix that problem for you. I'm the only one who can take care of your sin. I'm the only one who can take care of your sense of self-sufficiency. It's got to be me or nothing. And third, leprosy in that day was believed to be contagious by contact. So if somebody had leprosy, everybody avoided them. And I think God was saying, Moses, I can't send you back to Egypt to lead my people because if they sense you're just doing this out of your own self-sufficiency and your own wisdom and your own pride and your own ego, they are going to avoid you like the plague. They're not going to follow you because we all know that even when he went back in the power of God, he still had a hard time getting them to follow him. So holy ground is a place of confessed weakness. God, I can't do it, and I've got to quit trying to do it myself. Holy ground is a place of exposed sin. Lord, the problem isn't just in them. Some of the problem is in me. And third, holy ground is a place of no reputation. No reputation. You remember Moses was raised in Pharaoh's household. So he was used to moving among the elite. As a member of Pharaoh's household, when he walked into a room, servants jumped to their feet to be certain that they were ready to respond to any command, any wish, any request. He was used to people hanging on his every word. He was a part of the royal household. Now, he's a shepherd in the wilderness, and nobody hangs on any of his words. Nobody gives him any respect. He has no street cred out in the wilderness. He had some cred back in Egypt, but he's got no cred out in the wilderness. He's just another shepherd. And it must have felt like he had walked through the door to obscurity. When you're used to moving among the elite and the powerful, and then people just see you as nobody, it's hard to, hard to deal with. But he wasn't in a place of obscurity. He was standing on the threshold of liberty. And here's why. When we surrender the desire for reputation, that's when we find revelation. Revelation of God, revelation of God's power, and revelation of our own identity. When it stops being about you and starts being about God, you'll be amazed at how the things of God will start to come into focus. If you want revelation, you have to get rid of the desire for reputation. Now, somebody once described what happened in Moses' life beautifully. They said, Moses' life consisted of three chapters. The first 40 years, when he was raised in the royal household, household, to believe that he was something special. The next 40 years, when he languished in the wilderness and learned that he wasn't anything special. And then the final 40 years, when he set his people free and performed miracles because he had finally learned that only God is special. He was trained to think he was special. He had to learn he wasn't special. And then when he realized only God is special, that's when God could use him. 
And to be on holy ground is to get to that place where you realize only God is special. And it's not about you anymore. It's about God and God alone. Now, interestingly enough, Jesus understood this and Jesus practiced it. You go home and read the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians. And there he talks about Jesus who existed in equality with the Father and the Spirit as the member of the Trinity, but who laid it all aside and humbled himself and became a man and further humbled himself by becoming obedient and further humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus practiced downward mobility. He literally, according to Scripture, made himself of no reputation. And because of that, God highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name so that one day at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is God to the glory of the Father. See, Jesus understood that the way up in God's kingdom is down. When you humble yourself, God will exalt you. When you humble yourself, God will use you. When you make it about God, God can trust you. But as long as it's about you and you wanting people to think you're all that in a bag of chips, then God can't use you. Because you're more concerned about reputation. To put it differently, you can't tell people you're great and God is great in the same sentence. Somebody has to go. And if you want to understand the things of God, then you have to put aside this hungering for silly human reputation and seek nothing but the glory of God. Finally, holy ground is a place of freedom from fear. It's a place of freedom from fear. Scripture tells us, Hebrews 11 tells us, that Moses knew that if he went back to Egypt, he was going to experience ill treatment because he was got to be a part of the people of God who were being persecuted. But that he chose ill treatment with the people of God over the garbage that Egypt had to offer him. That he actually valued the reproach and the scorn he was going to receive because of his identification with God over anything that Egypt could offer him. He was going to go back and go nose to nose with the most powerful man politically and militarily and economically on the face of the earth, Pharaoh. He was got to call him down. He was going to demand, let my people go, knowing that that Pharaoh just need to speak one word and Moses would be executed on the spot. Where did he get that kind of courage? He got that courage because out there in the wilderness, he learned to value God above anything and everything else. And friends, I'm here to tell you that courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is the outgrowth of valuing God above everything else. When you value God, God's reputation, God's glory, God's kingdom, God's work, God's people, God's church, God's ministry above anything and everything else, the world will not be able to frighten you. Nothing will be able to frighten you. You won't have to whip up courage. Courage comes from having the right worldview. And God gave Moses that at the burning bush because that bush was a symbol of two things. It was a symbol of Moses and it was a symbol of the nation of Israel. God was saying, Moses, you're going through the flames of exile, but I won't let you be consumed. You're going to be my great liberator. And Moses, your people back in Egypt, they're going through the flames of slavery. But I will not let the people of Israel be extinguished. I will not let them be consumed. No matter what Egypt does to them, they will survive and they will walk out of that place with the wealth of Egypt in their pockets. You see, when you're on holy ground, renouncing your self-sufficiency, recognizing your own sin, confessing your own weakness, 
choosing no reputation. When you're on holy ground, your trials don't destroy you, they define you. When you're on holy ground. Now, if you're not on holy ground, trials can make a real mess in your life. <laughs> they really can. And especially if you're trying to do things in your own strength, one good trial can really make a mess. But when you're on holy ground, trials don't destroy you, they define you. Moses' trials would define him. Israel's trials would define them. It's been said that the biggest problem confronting the human race is the will out of place. God gave you a will, but he always intended that you would use your will to submit to him in recognition of his superiority. When the will is out of place, when we do things our way, when we set the agenda and just ask God to bless our agenda, when we rely upon ourselves rather than relying upon God, when we roll up our sleeves and take matters into our own hands, that's the will out of place. And it's been said that that is the disease of humanity and everything else is just symptoms. Ultimately, if you're going to fulfill God's purpose for you, if you're going to move in God's power for you, you have to let go of self-sufficiency and trust God and truly surrender to the Father's will. If you won't do that, then the rituals of faith, assembling together like this, singing songs about the greatness of God. The rituals of faith will be akin to hanging a room freshener, one of those little pine-scented room fresheners, in a garbage dump. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't change anything. This is why some folks bounce from church to church to church to church, from Christian counselor to Christian counselor to Christian counselor to Christian counselor, not because nobody is speaking the truth to them, but because they're hoping to somehow fix their mess without ever having to surrender to God. They're hoping some counselor, some pastor, some teacher will show them how they can maintain control and still know God's blessing. And so they look, and they try this one, and they try this one, and they get disillusioned. They move on to the next one, never coming to the knowledge of the truth because until you hand the keys to God and say, I'm going to trust you and you alone, it's never going to work. Now, let me say this in closing. There were days following that burning bush when Moses strayed from holy ground. <laughs> Because the reality is nobody practices surrender perfectly. None of us. I always like the fellow who said, in Romans, Paul tells us that we're to present ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. But he said the problem with a living sacrifice is it can climb off the altar anytime it wants to. You put a dead sacrifice, it's got to stay there. But a living sacrifice can say, Mm, didn't count on this, I'm stepping off. Okay. None of us practices surrender perfectly. We stray, and then we have to return, and we have to confess, and we have to repent, and Moses would have to do that. I have to do it. You'll have to do it. Okay. But if you will commit yourself to holy ground, You will understand the things of God. You will accomplish the things of God. You will be confident no matter what adversity you're facing because you'll be in that place where God can show you his strong arm. So before Moses could liberate his own people, Moses had to get liberated. Have you come to holy ground? Lord, I'm tired of the same old, same old. I need to let go and let you. Let's pray together. 
If there is some area of your life where you need to apply one or more of these principles, the Holy Spirit's already told you that. That's the one that's sticking like Velcro. That's the one that you're not getting past. That's the one that's hanging on. And as you've listened today, if there's something hanging on, don't you hang on to it. Take this moment and talk to God right now and say, Lord, thank you for showing me that in that matter, in that area, I'm not on holy ground. I'm in a place of self-sufficiency. I haven't been honest about my weakness. I haven't been honest about my sin. I've been desiring my own reputation. And then like Moses, take off your sandals in a spiritual sense and renounce past mistakes and commit yourself to surrendering to a God you can trust and ask Him to help you to stay the course so that from holy ground you can know Him and serve Him and bless others and fulfill your destiny in the earth. Because God didn't create you to just take up space and die. God created you unique to do something in his kingdom that nobody else can do. But you've got to be on holy ground. Father God, help us to understand what holy ground is. But beyond that, help us to die to self so that we can minister from holy ground and live on holy ground and experience the fullness of what you have for us. We don't want some cultural Christianity. We want full-blown Jesus-empowered living. We want holy ground. Help us to find it. Help us to stay there. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And